today I'm kind of going to share with you a lot about the impacts of climate, what we know, um, what we're expecting in terms of climate change locally, and then also a little bit about what the land trust course of action has been and will continue to be in response to climate change in the context of the rest of our climate change work, um, as or our conservation work. As Rebecca said, I was the conservation associate with the land trust for the last couple of years and I'm now transitioning uh, away to grad school, but I'm still deeply interested in the work that the land trust is doing in this area. Um, so before I begin, I actually just want to start with a land acknowledgement. Um, we are on the land where I'm presenting in Bend is the homelands of the Wasco and Warm Springs people um, who are now part of the Confederated Tribes of the Warm Springs, which also includes the Northern Paiute um, and the Northern Paiute traditionally have used parts of this area as well. Um, additionally, the Klamath Tribes uh, Klamath Trail runs north through this area toward the trading grounds that were traditionally at Celilo Falls on what we now call the Columbia River. And I want to take a moment to acknowledge that all the land that the Deschutes Land Trust works on um, belongs to these people uh, historically and presently. And I want to acknowledge the role that they have had in stewarding these lands. Um, if you're joining us from outside of Central Oregon, I encourage you to do a little bit of research on whose lands you inhabit and, and kind of think about that um, as you go about enjoying whatever place you're currently in or from. So to get started, uh, because we don't get to be outside, like Rebecca said, we're all joining from our screens. I want everyone to take a second to do a quick visualization. So wherever you are, wherever you live, whatever you call home, uh, I want you to take a second to just think about what you most value about where you live. It could be a place, a plant, an animal, community. And think about why you value this, just for a second. And as you're reflecting, you can think about, you know, how does this make you feel? Hold on to these feelings as we go through this presentation about climate change. And we'll come back to them a little bit later. And while we're on the topic of place, I'm going to introduce you to the places that the Deschutes Land Trust works. Um, we work in the Deschutes Basin. So that's basically all the area where water drains into the Deschutes River. And this map shows our preserves and our conservation easements. We've been around for 25 years, protected almost 13,000 acres of land. We have nine conservation easements, nine preserves. We work on over 10 rivers and creeks. So it's a big area. There's a lot going on. And there's a lot that stands to change um, when it comes to climate change. And so I wanna dive straight into what you all came to hear about, which is climate change in the Deschutes Basin and what the Land Trust is hoping to do with respect to climate change. And that's the main question that I wanna answer today. So to begin, we'll kind of dive into, you know, what is climate change? Let's get 100% on the same page about what we mean when we talk about climate change. Um, very basically, Climate change is any long-term change in regional or global climate patterns. It can include cooling, warming, and other atmospheric trends or conditions. But when we talk about climate change right now, we are talking about human-caused or anthropogenic, anthropogenic climate change. Uh, this is the rapid intensification and acceleration of warming trends that's been happening since the Industrial Revolution, so the late 1800s, mid-1800s. This warming is due to the greenhouse effect, which is a phenomenon caused by heat trapping gases in our atmosphere, which are primarily released by humans burning fossil fuels. So just as a baseline, that's where we're at. And what you're looking at on your screen is a visual representation of how temperature has increased in Oregon since the late 1800s. So on the left, you have the late 1800s. On the right, you have 2018 and every band represents a year. 
of either uh, cooler or warmer than average, basically. You're seeing the trend of warming as things get redder and redder and redder. And you can see that super dark red band was uh, 2015, which is continues to be the hottest year on record, um, at least in Oregon and also in much of the American West. So a little bit of a visual to, to start us off. More specifically, um, in Central Oregon, we are, as a land trust, thinking about all kinds of different climate impacts. So our work typically is conserving um, open space, river systems, forests, high desert landscapes, and we know that all of those things are likely to change um, as temperatures in the atmosphere increase. And so we also think about a lot of those specific um, ecosystem types, landscape types, when we're thinking about climate change. And one of those big ones for us is rivers and streams. Um, what you're looking at is kind of the southwestern corner of the Deschutes Basin. I apologize if this map is a little small, a little hard to understand. But what you're really looking at is a warming trend in stream temperatures. So on the left, you have kind of our historical or baseline, more recent average stream temperatures. And on the right, you're looking at uh, projected stream temperatures for the 2040s. And if you look closely, you'll notice that there's a lot less dark blue and kind of aqua, and we're trending a lot more into those full on reds and oranges. Um, and this means that, you know, for a lot of species, um, they might not be able to adapt to that level of warming. So thinking about fish for sure, but also thinking about all of the life that supports a healthy river ecosystem, whether that's macroinvertebrates, certain types of algae, certain plants that depend on specific water temperatures, all of those kinds of things. Um, there will also be changes in nutrient load and availability, changes in flow level and timing. And these things are happening at a pace that's pretty different than what species are used to adapting to. Um, another thing we're, we're thinking about a lot, and that's a more general effect of climate change is loss of biodiversity. So in this area, that includes both plants and animals, obviously it can include thinking about what wildflowers are we gonna lose? What types of sagebrush steppe habitat might disappear or move? All these kinds of things that I might get into a little bit more later. Um, and then a big thing we think about as well is snowpack, right? We live in the Cascades. Well, if you're in Central Oregon, we're in the Cascades and a big part of our life here revolves around these mountains and the water they hold in the form of snow and the water we expect them to hold and hope they hold well into the summer um, that then melts into our stream and river systems throughout the year, provides us with drinking water, water for irrigation, all kinds of benefits that, that we really rely on. And so um, what we know is that we stand to lose a lot of the snowpack, a lot of the water held in by the mountains. Um, in 2019, the most recent, what they call um, Oregon Climate Assessment Report came out. So that's a really comprehensive look at the projected impacts of climate change and the ongoing impacts of climate change around the state. And from that, we know that most of the Northwest, including Oregon, will see decreases in April 1st snowpack, which is just a measure of like, when are we seeing snowpack and how much. Um, so decreases in April 1st snowpack greater than 56%. So that's a huge decrease um, in the next several decades. In a high cascade, so the very highest peaks, that range might be closer to more like 11 to 33% decrease, and it's still a really significant change in how much snow our system is receiving and holding. Um, we're also going to see a lot more what they would consider hot days in, uh, in the Cascades. We're expected to have at least 30 more hot days, which is greater than 86 degrees Fahrenheit, which for the mountains is pretty warm, um, by mid-century, so by 2050 or so. In Eastern Oregon, we're warming at about 0.9 degrees Fahrenheit per decade or half a degree Celsius. So things are moving quickly. Um, there's no sign they're turning around and that's all contributing to this loss of snowpack. Um, and at the same time, we're expecting a lot more extreme precipitation. 
um, especially east of the Cascades, and a significant proportion of that precipitation will be rain rather than snow. And so we get less snow in the first place and then a compounding effect in which we'll get increasing, we call rain on snow events. So that's uh, precipitation coming down as rain, which is warmer than snow, hitting the snow, accelerating melting, and then further accelerating the loss of snowpack in the Cascades. So that's kind of a feedback loop um, or compounding effect that we see a lot within the scope of climate change impacts that we consider both locally and globally. Um, and then all of these things feed back into our river systems, obviously. So everything I just said about rivers connects to snow, um, but it also connects to things like fuel availability uh, for fires. So how do our forests and desert systems, our grasslands respond to these changes in water availability? Um, Drought obviously is connected to water availability and flooding, um, and particularly with rain on snow events, that's a, a really dramatic increase in melt at one time that can lead to, to greater flooding events, which has all kinds of impacts on both ecological and human systems. But the bottom line is we're probably going to see a lot less of what you're looking at right now, those snowy peaks we know and love, and a lot more of this, right? Um, this kind of barren, snow-free, glacier-free mountain system in our backyards, which has both, uh, both an emotional and an ecological toll, for sure. So the other thing we think about a lot in uh, Central Oregon and east of the Cascades more generally uh, is fire. And that is sort of, I think, on a lot of people's minds all the time this time of year. We're coming out of the snowy season. We're coming out of springtime where we might see rain and we're starting to get drier, hotter conditions um, more regularly. And what you're looking at is a fire that's pretty recent. This is from about five, six years ago, um, kind of right in our backyard. And this is something that people generally fear will be a, a pretty big impact of climate change, that we get more frequent, higher severity fires um, that are harder to control, harder to recover from, threaten human communities and ecosystems. And um, that's certainly going to likely be the case in, uh, in Central Oregon. It's, uh, like I said, that report in 2019 that covers Oregon has all kinds of projections, all kinds of data about climate change impacts. And uh, fire is one of them that is a little less clear. The general consensus is, yes, there will be more. They will be more intense. They will be more frequent. Um, but we're a little bit lucky in the Northwest compared to some other parts of the United States. That being said, pine dominant forests, which is what we all live in in Central Oregon, uh, also stand to probably have greater increases in, uh, in severe fire in kind of the near future than some of the wetter, more fir dominated forest types. And then another thing I want to talk about is people. So when, uh, when you think about conservation, it's often easy to forget about the human role in the natural landscape um, and the fact that it's often really, really difficult to separate, you know, what do we mean by the human world? What do we mean by the non-human world? And with climate change, that's no different. So a few things that really deeply connect um, our ecosystems and climate change and people are, uh, for one, agriculture because things are gonna get warmer and at least in the near term wetter, we would expect uh, an increase of about one month in our growing season. Central Oregon's not known for a long growing season. So in some respects, maybe that's a, a small positive, but at the same time, those warmer conditions are gonna lead to more pests, more weeds and invasive species, more water scarcity and decreased water quality, um, which can all have effects on agriculture. We also are expecting to see about uh, one month later for our first freeze of the year. So that's a pretty big shift within kind of the next several decades in how our agricultural systems might work locally. Um, there's also a lot of, like I mentioned, there are kind of these compounding effects and feedback loops and a lot of the stressors we've discussed. So fires, floods, increasing landslides with extreme, extreme precipitation events, things like that can have pretty significant effects on our infrastructure. So whether that's roads, passes, highways, all that, whether that's energy transmission and distribution and the infrastructure associated with that, 
um, all of these kind of more extreme events stand to potentially impact those systems. And then finally, just thinking about um, kind of the equity and justice side of climate change, there are also known disproportionate impacts of climate change on lower income, marginalized communities, and Black, Indigenous, and people of color. Um, this can include things like urban heat islands and areas that have a lot less green space, and this does include Bend, um, people that have less access to consistent food, which can be compounded by drought, compounded by declining agriculture, um, compounded by decreases in water quality, which we'll get back to as well. And then public health concerns. Um, as heat increases in the air, uh, people's risk of heat exposure, heat stress, um, compounding effects of existing conditions and illnesses all stand to increase and folks who are lower income tend to have less access to the resources they might need to withstand some of those compounding conditions. So those are some of the effects that we're thinking about, some of the impacts. They're really wide ranging. Um, they touch every part of the basin, they touch every person in the basin. And the question again becomes, why does the land trust care? What are we gonna do about it? And we care because not only is this our home, but it's also all of the systems we work in. We work with farmers and ranchers. We work in forest systems. We work on streams and rivers. We work depending on the snowpack to kind of feed our landscapes. And so the main ways we think about climate change responses fall into these two categories that you've probably heard before, but it's worth revisiting what we mean when we talk about mitigation and adaptation. And mitigation is very simply reducing emissions, reducing the actual warming that's happening. And that can happen by just emitting less greenhouse gas in the first place, or by removing greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. And there are a variety of ways to do that that I'll kind of touch on in a few minutes. Then there's adaptation, which is saying, okay, there's going to be change. There already has been change. Um, so what do we do to respond to that? Um, and that's both within natural and human systems. And adaptation, I think more so than mitigation even, is really where the Deschutes Land Trust and all land trusts can, can make a huge difference on, on a really local level. So kind of diving into what that looks like for us internally. Um, we have a climate change strategy that we have at the Land Trust used since 2017, and this really guides our thinking around mitigation and adaptation and how we can implement those on the ground. And it covers all parts of our work, so not just conservation, what lands do we protect, but also stewardship, how do we care for those lands, outreach, how do we get people onto those lands and educate them about what we're doing, um, and kind of our internal structures too. Like how sustainable are we as an organization? Can we really walk our talk when it comes to climate change and conservation? Um, and so that's kind of this, this foundational piece we're thinking about. Um, and adaptation looks like a lot of things. Um, and one of those things it looks like is restoration for us. So like I said, we work a lot in river systems that includes thinking about those big kind of iconic species like steelhead and salmon and thinking about how do we restore those systems to help these species adapt. Um, a lot of these systems have been impaired over the last century or so by different human activities. Climate change, like I said, compounds those by warming temperatures, changing nutrient loads, changing water availability, all of that. Um, and so through restoration, uh, whether that's kind of de-straightening a stream, adding more complexity to a channel, cooling down a stream, adding more vegetation, those things can kind of buy a species some time, right? Let them continue to live in their, their natural environment for longer. And that's one way to think about adaptation that um, we've been doing for a long time as a land trust. Restoration is part of what we do, but more recently we've been able to add the lens of climate change to, to that consideration. And then another way to think about adaptation is, okay, things are changing. Um, sometimes they're changing irreversibly or really extremely. So in, a, in the aftermath of a really intense fire, this is up in Skyline Forest after the fire there from a few years ago. Um, how do we manage these constantly changing ecosystems? If we can't slow down or stop that change, 
what do we do once it's already happened? Um, and so fire is a really great example of that. What does it look like if, if a fire goes through a land that we manage? How do we respond to that? How do we understand shifts in where species are able to exist moving forward in a forest system? Um, and how do we kind of facilitate that in a smart way as a land trust? And to a large extent, these are open questions, but um, we're working on them pretty constantly on the stewardship side. And then another way we think about adaptation is kind of on this broader level. So sharing two more maps with you, which um, you'll get after the presentation if you really want to take a deeper dive. But on the left, what you're looking at is what we call um, connectivity. So these lighter blue areas that you're seeing are really well connected. The gray areas are um, they're urban areas. They're really not very well connected. Species have a hard time moving across them. That's what connectivity means is how well can a species move across an area. Um, and we know that the more we can keep lands connected, the easier time animals will have and plants will have moving to adapt to changing conditions, right? So if it gets too warm here, maybe I can go there and I can survive, but if there's no connectivity, I can't get there. So very simply, how can we as a land trust hold open those spaces that are already well connected? Another thing we're thinking about is what um, researchers call climate refugia or climatic refugia. And those are spaces that will kind of continue to offer um, particularly the temperature conditions that species need to survive into the future. So um, this is two different colors. The lighter pink is into the 2050s, what's considered a refuge for species. And the darker kind of magenta red color is into the 2080s, what will be sort of available as a refuge. And, um, if we know what those areas are, maybe we can spend a little more time protecting those areas. We're also thinking about a concept um, called climate resilience, which is thinking about what's the, the geography, the topography, the geology, the soils, kind of these physical aspects of the land. Um, do they protect a greater range of temperatures? And can we kind of hold some of those spaces that are more resilient into the future um, for, for different plants and animals to survive on and can we conserve and restore those spaces. And so these are pretty big um, new concepts for land trusts, but they also let us take a much, a much broader view of how we can enter the climate change space when it comes to adaptation. And it's pretty exciting. So then we can start to put those things all together. Um, again, I understand these maps are probably really small, um, but what you're seeing in those red circles is on the left taking together some of these terrestrial things. So resilience, connectivity, um, known threatened and endangered species, and resilient lands, and highlighting, okay, where is their private land, because we work on private land exclusively, that um, we might be able to conserve, protect, restore into the future. And on the right, we're looking at similar considerations, but for river systems. So what are kind of those sweet spots that moving forward make a lot of sense to, to take a second look at as a conservation organization? And so that brings me to um, mitigation, which we maybe have less of a role in as a uh, land trust. We can't um, as easily influence whether industries are emitting a lot of greenhouse gases or individuals are emitting a lot of greenhouse gases. But what we can do is we can influence how much we're absorbing out of the atmosphere, how much carbon we're storing or sequestering. And we can do that through a variety of mechanisms that include things just as simply as conserving lands, not letting them be converted into um, uses that wouldn't store as much carbon, whether that's residential development, industrial development or something else. And we can also enhance the ability of systems to store carbon. So whether that's helping restore wetlands and wet meadows or restoring forest systems, um, there's a big role there. And recently research has found that as much as 30% of the mitigation that we need to hold warming to under two degrees Celsius, which is kind of like the accepted threshold for how much warming we could hit without really seeing pretty significant deterioration of our human and natural systems. Um, we can have about 30% of that need through natural climate solutions. So conserving wetlands, conserving forests, conserving grasslands, and all these things that are really core to what the climate, uh, to what the land trust and all land trusts do. And what you're seeing in this photo is um, 
some volunteers and staff at the land trust building beaver dam analogs and that's one way to help systems both retain um, more carbon because they're functioning better their plant life is more thriving the wetlands are functioning better and at the same time cooling down the system helping restore the stream to its natural function serving a restoration function for all those species that depend on river systems and then moving right along because um, i want to save some time for people to to ask questions I do want to circle back to um, what's the land trust thinking about in terms of human components and how can the land trust think about climate change right now while we're collectively reckoning with these really big urgent issues like systemic racism and a global pandemic. Do these things connect to each other and if so how um, and I would argue that the answer is yes, they do connect to each other. And not only can we think about climate change in relationship to these other ongoing systemic issues, but we have to because they all fit together in ways that are really hard to take apart from one another. And so I want to take a minute to dive back into what I've been calling kind of the compounding of effects of climate change or what's sometimes known as a multiplier effect. Um, and there are a lot of ways that we can think about this. So I'm going to share a few of them. Um, and I invite you to kind of think about in your own space, in your own world, in your own life, where do you see these multiplier effects of climate change that both relate to the non-human world and the human world that you live in? So pre-pandemic, uh, it was already pretty well established that climate change for a variety of reasons had contributed to the recent increase in um, emerging infectious diseases over the last couple of decades. And there are kind of a wide variety of reasons for this. And I'm happy to share some resources after um, this presentation if you're interested in learning more. Um, but that is a well-established trend throughout the world. Um, and we know at the same time that climate change and environmental hazards disproportionately affect low-income folks and Black, Indigenous, and people of color. So those two things are happening at once already. Um, pandemic or no pandemic, that's going on. Um, and in terms of those disproportionate effects of climate change, we're talking about things like um, people of color being more likely to live near waste disposal sites, less access to clean air and water, less financial ability to respond to a crisis or to an environmental hazard. Um, and at the same time, these are also communities that tend to have some of the lowest carbon footprints. So we've got these kind of ironic and interacting forces happening. And this is, uh, is pretty well established throughout the world, right? You've probably heard about rising sea levels affecting communities on the front lines of climate change. It's easy to not think about that in our own backyard because we don't live in the ocean, on the ocean. We don't have some of these things in our face all the time. But I do wanna share an example of where the pandemic um, the marginalization of groups and racism and climate change are all interacting that is right in Central Oregon. Um, so this trend that the pandemic disproportionately affects people of color is true in Central Oregon and it is happening right now on the reservation of the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs. So Recall the, the land acknowledgement I made at the beginning of this presentation, the land we are currently on, the people whose ancestral lands we are currently on are facing disproportionate impacts of COVID-19. Within the last week, this community of roughly 3,200 has reported 19 new cases of COVID-19. And as of last week, as of last Thursday, the reservation is on a boil water notice after a water main broke for the second time in two years. It's left 60% of the reservation with um, low water pressure in addition to being on a boil water notice. And in some cases, folks have no access to running water at all. Um, this is about an hour and a half from where I'm sitting right now that this is happening. So we have compounding issues, right? Greater infection rate is happening. At the same time, there's poor water access, which makes sanitation more difficult. We know that that's one of the best ways to prevent the spread of COVID-19, washing your hands, staying clean. Um, the more basic concern that people need water to live all of the time and the compounding concern that should a climate exacerbated fire strike right now, 
would there be access to water enough to put that out and to protect the community from this climate exacerbated natural hazard um, of a wildfire. Meanwhile, all of this is steeped in a history that dates back to early white settlement in what we now call Oregon and the 1855 treaty that forced the tribes, the three tribes that make up the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs onto their reservation in the first place. And this is how compounding systems work, right? This is how we have to think about climate change with systemic racism and injustice with systems like a global pandemic. Um, and as a land trust, we kind of have to pay attention to these wider forces at work, right? Because how can we do the work we do without understanding these broader and interwoven effects on our local communities? And this very much is our local community. The main point here, um, not only in Central Oregon, but everywhere, is that climate change operates as part of a very complex human and natural set of systems. And I really encourage you to, to sort of chew on that more um, as we move on from this presentation. And as you think about that question I asked at the beginning of like, what do you value? What are the systems that connect to that thing you value? Which we'll come back to in a minute. So that's a lot to chew on, right? It's a lot of impacts. That's a lot of thinking about what is the land trust doing locally and what are those broader forces at work that we're operating within, um, both as an organization and as a community. And so the question becomes, what can you do, right? Like, let's have a little bit of hope um, in the context of a pretty overwhelming set of circumstances. And so this is not an exhaustive list on your screen right now, but these are some of the things that right now you can dive into. Um, climate change is a system, it's global, it's overwhelming, but it has local impacts and you can do your part to understand what those are. You can understand how those local impacts operate within broader systems and structures. Right now, volunteering might be hard at the land trust. It's not really possible. Um, normally I would encourage you to volunteer for the land trust, but you can look into organizations doing good climate work. You can donate to organizations doing good climate work. You can vote for climate responsive and climate conscious politicians, measures, et cetera. And you can also kind of work in your own space. You can work on changing personal habits and recognizing how you participate in broader systems that influence those habits and norms. You can educate people around you and you yourself can be a good steward. You can be part of you know, giving species a better shot at adapting, at surviving um, climate change into the next several decades and the next several centuries. And so before we move into uh, some what is it that you value in your home, wherever that is right now or wherever you're quarantining, um, how will climate change affect this thing you value? What do you, what do your community stand to lose? And what are the, some of the things you can do to get involved to mitigate that loss? Um, and I'll kind of let people think about that on their own. And I'm happy to take questions and expand on anything for the last little bit of our time together. Thanks for listening. Thanks so much, Fiona. Um, I know that was a lot to, to chew on and to take in. So um, give folks a, a bit of time uh, to ask their questions. We'll go ahead and facilitate that by asking questions into the chat box. And then I will um, pull those out and, and see what we can uh, what we can answer in the next 10 or so minutes. Uh, 15 minutes, maybe, if we're lucky. So uh, I have a question to get us kicked off, Fiona. Um, and feel free to go as, as in-depth or, or as quick as you want on these questions, of course. But um, the first question I'd ask, and it's one of the things you listed on your kind of call to action slide there just before this one. Um, what tips do you have for talking to, to family members um, about climate change or, or talking to good friends about climate change and and how do you um, balance that or, or do you always just talk about climate change and never talk <laughs> to anything else? Um, what, what tips do you have? 
That is a good question. Um, I am frequently definitely the buzzkill that brings climate change into a conversation that didn't have it in it before. So um, that's definitely one route. Like I kind of indicated, everything connects to climate change one way or another. So you can always kind of weave it in. Um, but I think in terms of really getting people to to think, to listen, to care, um, I try to think more about being specific, being tangible, being place-based. And so that kind of mini visualization I was prompting people to do is really connected to the way that I think is more broadly a successful strategy for talking about climate change. And, and that could be with people who are totally on board that, yeah, it's happening, it's totally a problem, but it's pretty easy to ignore, right? It's, it's so big, what can I do about it? So to give folks, you know, no, what it's affecting is that wildflowers are emerging earlier, which is affecting pollinator patterns, which is affecting local food systems, which is affecting your access to food, which is affecting the way you cook every day, like building those chains of connection in a way that people can see and feel in their own homes. Um, and that's kind of a practice to develop. I think um, it's hard, but that's probably my biggest, my biggest piece of advice. My biggest thought there is really um, forming connections to place and to to real life because it's really hard to be like oh yeah we've seen a degree of warming in the last decade but like it still snows here and I'm cold at night so what am I supposed to do um, and then I think the other thing is sometimes talking about it if you're in a place where you're like I'm really stressed out I am despairing about this giant issue um, talking about it with people can kind of help work through that right climate change like I mentioned earlier has a pretty emotional toll to it. Um, it's heavy, it's depressing, that's real, that's not just you, that's, um, that's a thing. And so I think talking about it can really help kind of address that head on. Thanks, yeah, it, I thank you for uh, recognizing the toll that it can take to, to talk about it and also sometimes that emotional labor. Um, Another question, uh, so you spoke a lot about uh, kind of the impacts and the effects that we might be able to expect or um, that will increase in the next coming years or so. Um, the question here is, in climate change, many people in these discussions talk about tipping points. Mm -hmm. um, can you give us an idea or, or share a little bit? Are we nearing a tipping point? Are we past a tipping point? Is that a question you can even answer? Is that a question anyone can answer? Um, and, and are we seeing these impacts already? Are they gonna just drastically get worse or is there still time and hope? Where are we? Yeah, um, so tipping points are pretty complicated field subject um they've kind of become more of a hot topic maybe in the last decade or so maybe a little more and oftentimes when people talk about tipping points they're talking about um global collapse of systems so um there's some really big ones people talk about like the melting of um greenland's ice sheet the melting of permafrost the destruction of the Amazon rainforest, the collapse of coral reef systems, like the Great Barrier Reef. And these are basically um, systems where, you know, we're warming, we're warming, we're warming, we're changing, we're changing. And we get closer and closer to um, basically a point of no return where these systems can no longer handle that stress, whatever it is. And there's a place where you know you're going you're going you're going and it's in a way it's kind of like chopping down a tree you're swinging an axe and you're swinging an axe and then there's that one hit where it falls right um and that's kind of like what a tipping point is um are we nearing them yes can i elaborate to an extent that feels useful right now maybe not but we can follow up with more resources um and they're a little hard to grapple with because they are really global in nature um, most of the time, but there are also some tipping points we can think about locally that look a little different. So thinking about, you know, will a local ecosystem um, have enough of a shift that it doesn't 
come back to kind of its historical condition that we would expect, whether that's from an extreme event or something else. There's also a healthy debate here about whether historical conditions are even a useful baseline to go from. Um, but, you know, one example I've heard of a local or a, a more kind of locally focused tipping point could be after a cataclysmic fire or series of cataclysmic fires, does the forest return to any kind of structure we might have anticipated historically to exist in that space? Um, or is there a point past which combining climate impacts won't allow that to happen? Um, and I know that's, uh, that's a bit of a roundabout way uh, to answer that question, but it's an interesting thing to dive into and the Land Trust does have a blog post on tipping points if you want to learn more. Thanks. And of course, you know, I'm putting you on the spot. We're putting you on the spot with these. And um, a lot of these questions are, are data rich or data heavy and, and very specific. So no problem with giving us roundabout uh, answers. Um, the next one that might be kind of interesting, if you want to do a, a, a try a response for, um, if climate change is changing Central Oregon, um, and those habitats that are within Central Oregon, does that mean that the wildlife we see is also going to change, um, or, or the plants, I guess, also? Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, uh, very, very basically, the anticipated outcome or answer is yes, uh, both plants and wildlife will change. The question is on what timelines, to what extent does that mean they're, um, they're just moving? So, so species have different options, right? In response to stressors, they can basically move to a new place that fits their needs. Uh, so that's where things like connectivity are important. They can adapt, um, so they can kind of change how they operate within a system. Um, whether that's through, you know, changes in behavior or, or otherwise, or they die and that's the more extreme outcome. And so we're likely to see a combination of all three of those responses. It just depends on the species. It depends on their sensitivity to increased heat, um, to changes in resource availability to other human actions. Um, what we're also likely to see is a lot of change in timing. So, you know, within our lifetimes, it's, it's super possible that we're going to see a lot of the same things. We just might see them at different times. So that's things like bird migrations changing, um, large uh, ungulate species that are common here, like mule deer, like elk, their migration patterns changing, the timing of that changing, where they're able to um, create winter habitat or to use winter habitat changing, fish species changing. Um, and then forest composition and location changing as well. So that's, there's this idea of encroachment that um, holds that basically some species will find that climate change really suits them in new places. They'll move into those places and there will be competition or the, you know, historically the species that have been there will no longer be as successful and they will either also move or perhaps die. So Again, a roundabout answer. There's there's a lot to unpack there, and there are a lot of ways of thinking about that. But generally, yes, you could expect to see some changes, and that's very much something that's on the land trust's mind. Is kind of this idea of um, adaptive, like we're adapting to, right? We're managing maybe totally different compositions of different plants and animals within our preserves, within the places we work. Thanks. As people, we have to adapt too. I sure do. Gift. Um, so another question, and you spoke for a little bit about some of the natural climate solutions mm -hmm. um, that the Land Trust is engaged with and also that other organizations and um, community groups throughout, I mean, really globally are engaged with. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, conserving and protecting land is a natural climate solution. Um, Ed here has a question about beaver dam analogs. Um, yeah. And maybe if you want to share a little bit about beaver dam analogs, really the question is, could you tell us more? Um, what, how are these things working? Why? Um, and I can jump into a little bit. Definitely. Yeah, so beaver dam analogs are, first of all, cool. Um, they are kind of a sweet spot too between mitigation and adaptation. They have some mitigation implications. They also helped 
areas adapt, which I talked about a little bit. But what is a beaver dam analog? Um, if you've seen a beaver dam, and beavers are common here, or at least historically were common, they're kind of coming back in central Oregon. Um, one of the effects that beaver dams has is to um, kind of help a riparian system function, to help a, a floodplain function. So um, it'll help spread water across a floodplain in a more intact river system, at least, that has a connected floodplain. And it can help actually shape or reshape the way a river um, flows, can help hold water in certain areas. And Rebecca, feel free to, to jump in with more on that um, once I kind of wrap my thoughts. But that's, that's the function typically in part of a beaver dam. Um, there are other, that's not exhaustive, but that's part of it. And in a lot of places where beaver have disappeared in particular, we don't have that function naturally anymore. So uh, around here, we see a lot of river systems that have been straightened where the river is below its floodplain or disconnected from the floodplain. Typically rivers can spill out and spread across a landscape, um, depends on the river. But here, that's kind of the natural thing we would expect in a lot of creeks and streams. And uh, beaver dam analog is basically humans making something that looks like a beaver dam to serve the function of a beaver dam to help that river system work better. So what you saw in that photo um, a couple slides ago, I don't know if I can go back to it, but um, was people building a, a fake beaver dam or a beaver dam analog. And so what we've seen on our preserves where we've put those in is that very quickly the uh, the structure has influenced the way flow goes through the stream on our preserve, the way water is held, the way water spreads out, um, and even at times kind of the, the meandering path of the river. Rebecca, I don't know if you want to add anything more. This is like a, a very new thing too that we're getting into as a more passive restoration option. Yeah, so like Fiona mentioned, um, those beaver dam analogs are, um, or post-assisted structures as well, um, are created by teams of volunteers and, and staff and also um, contractors at times to help mimic some of those positive effects that we see happening from the beaver species that either historically would have been there or um, are there. So there are some instances where the land trust is um, working a bit complementarily with the beavers um, to try and jumpstart some of those streamways. Um, like Fiona said, this is pretty new. So the um, beaver dam analogs that we installed at the land trust properties uh, were just installed last fall. So we're still collecting data on them, understanding how they've changed water, understanding how the willow are growing up in those areas that are now wetter than they were last year or um, different things like that. So uh, you can see it with the land trust and also so lots of other places, um, if you search beaver dam analogs, it's a pretty cool uh, restoration technique, low impact restoration technique um, that relies on a lot of natural systems to really get jump started and then continue on um, doing the thing. So it's pretty neat. Anything else, Fiona, um, related to other natural climate solutions that you think are really neat or interesting? I think um, one of them in Central Oregon that's cool to think about that we maybe often miss in the discussion, you know, there's a lot of discussion of carbon markets, of forests being the biggest terrestrial sequestration um, ecosystem type. And, and that's really exciting, but we, what we have in Central Oregon is also grasslands. Um, and that's kind of an unknown space, but it is known to be one of the natural climate solutions. So the more we can kind of conserve our grassland spaces, um, the better we are in terms of our ability to help with the kind of carbon storage side of climate change mitigation, which is just something I like to think about. I don't know. Everyone likes to think about carbon storage and climate mitigation. All the time. <laughs> um, well, Fiona, we've got three minutes or so left, so I don't know if you have any parting words for us. Um, a hopeful poem or, or something to make us excited about climate change and then um, I'll wrap us up. Yeah, um, no, I think I've probably overwhelmed people a little bit with the fire hose and it kind of is a fire hose, but there's a lot of cool stuff out there to learn and also some terrifying stuff. Um, if you are interested in knowing more, 
the Deschutes Land Trust, um, thanks in large part to Rebecca's work, has a whole lot of content on climate change and on local climate change impacts and solutions. So you can read our climate change strategy at that link that's on this slide and we can send that out afterward. Um, we have pretty regular blog posts connected to climate change, different events connected to climate change. Um, and so it's an ongoing conversation. And I think we're really interested in also learning from other people, definitely. Lots to learn and lots of different perspectives to learn from. So I would say if you're excited or interested, reach out, share with us, ask more questions, help educate us. We love it all. Well, I couldn't agree more. Thank you so much, Fiona, um, for your, your comeback tour with the land. <laughs> and um, like she mentioned, if you're at all interested, we are a community organization and, and we have volunteers and, and members and donors that really make all of this possible. Um, like Fiona mentioned, we'll, we'll do our best to share some resources with folks who are able to make it today. So um, we'll share out our climate change strategy and some of the other maps and things Fiona mentioned. Um, thanks so much for joining. I know we're right at the hour. You get off right at five. Um, so thank you for your support just by being here and also for your support um, in other ways as volunteers, members, donors. We really do appreciate it. So we have a whole suite of virtual talks and events. Our next one coming up, I believe, um, is this month on the 15th, and it's all about bats with a local biologist. Um, so we'll hope to see you there. If you made your way here, I'm sure you can find your way to register for that one on our website as well or um, on our social media. Otherwise, we'll see you soon, and thank you so much for coming.